and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Samuel Brunson, Georgia Rethal Professor of Law at Loyola University Chicago School of Law. We will discuss his book, God and the IRS, Accommodating Religious Practice in United States Tax Law, which is published by Cambridge University Press. So welcome to the show, Sam. Thanks, Brian. It's good to be here. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So this is a really fun and interesting book that I found especially appealing as a nonprofit law professor or occasional nonprofit law (laughs) professor, because so much of the stuff you're talking about the book comes up in in the context of of that class. And you really did a great job of helping me think more coherently about how to approach uh, how to approach some of these subjects. But for for listeners who, unlike myself, <laughs> don't spend their time reading and teaching nonprofit law, I wonder if we can start by kind of contextualizing the subject matter of your book in, in the law more generally. So I was hoping you could start by talking a little bit about how the law currently conceptualizes like constitutional and legal limits on government actions regulating religious people and religious practice and religious beliefs? So I would love it if I could. And it turns out the answer to that is complicatedly and chaotically. <laughs> I mean, we, we have to start with, with the constitutional rules, the First Amendment, basically. So the First Amendment says that Congress has to provide for the free exercise of religion and can't establish a religion. And what those two things mean is really hard to nail down. In general, it means that the government can't establish a church. It can't favor one religion over another. It can't favor religion over non-religion. And the free exercise clause means it can't pass laws saying for example, it, banning meeting together for religious purposes on Sundays or on Saturdays or on Fridays or doing certain religious things. The problem is there are limitations on both of those. So the Supreme Court has found that under certain circumstances, the government can prohibit religious practices, at least if it does it in a neutral way. And in some circumstances, the government can allow special benefits to go to religion. It, it, maybe for our purposes, the big one is it, the government, while it can't favor religion, it's allowed to allow churches to be exempt from taxation. So that's a benefit that the government gives to churches. But broadly speaking, it's a benefit that also goes to a lot of other nonprofit organizations. So that that's broadly the context. Exactly where the lines lie is hard. They seem to be changing on, a, if not a year-by-year basis, at least every five or ten years. Um, there seem to be new questions, and those new questions seem to come up with slightly different answers. Um, in fact, one of them, when we deal, if we talk about the parsonage allowance. Um, we can get into some of the changes that are going on with that right now. So broadly contextualized, the question is, can the government provide certain benefits to religious people or can it treat religious practices differently? And my interest is with the tax law. Um, And so the question is, can the tax law benefit religious practice and can it impose a burden on religious practice? Right, right. Okay. So, I mean, is there in general like a framework that courts use in thinking about when the government can impose a burden on religion or like a, a kind of a heuristic that courts can use in figuring out whether or not a particular arguable benefit to religion is constitutional or not? Or is it just totally ad hoc? So it's not totally ad hoc as much as it is. It's not totally clear what the test is and what the standard is under current law. So for a long time, there was what was called the lemon test that governed 
governed these questions. Then the Supreme Court started to step away, but it never officially overturned it. They, it there's a recent case dealing with a cross on public land where it's not completely clear what the holding is because there are, I don't know, like 15 opinions between nine justices and it's hard to say <laughs> that there may be some plurality opinions, but it's hard to say what exactly the holding is. But in there, the justices seem to be moving from the lemon test to a historical relevance test, only they don't say there's no lemon test. So I don't know that it's so much ad hoc as it's just not completely clear what the appropriate test is, which leaves lower courts kind of guessing and trying to figure it out. Mm. Mm, okay, so it sounds like the the from the from the kind of constitutional side, it's a, the the sort of circumstances of the law are a little confused. But m maybe we can shift our focus then and talk about something simple like the tax law. That's perfect because the tax law it turns out these constitutional questions in con law people hate it when I say this, but the constitution doesn't matter because the Supreme Court has held that. The government has such a compelling interest in collecting revenue that no tax law in unconstitutionally burdens religious practice. So the, the government can tax religious practices. If you say, for example, my religion prohibits me from paying taxes, and I want to talk about that in just a minute, even if you're legitimately sincere, even if that's your religion has an article of faith that says thou shalt not pay taxes. Um, the Supreme Court has said the interest in revenue is strong enough that it overcomes your free exercise right to not pay taxes. So on the one hand, there's no mandatory accommodation. The government can tax religious practice. On the other hand, the government, it's really hard to challenge an accommodation. So if the government says, hey, we want to treat the Amish better in a way by exempting the Amish from the self-employment tax, because of the Tax Anti-Injunction Act, no one really has standing to challenge that. I mean, maybe a self-employed Amish person maybe would have standing to challenge it, but they don't have the economic incentive to challenge it. So you've kind of got two things. One is there, there's really no nothing that's going to be unconstitutional. And I, I want to cabin that a little bit by saying if the government said we're only going to tax Muslims, that would be something different. But if there's a generally applicable tax that applies to a religious person, they don't have a religious right not to pay that. On the other hand, if the government wants to say, hey, we're providing this additional benefit to religious practitioners, Nobody really has ch standing to challenge that. So in the tax world of accommodate of religious individuals, uh, the constitutional limits, whatever they are, don't seem to matter so much. So I, I wonder just just to clarify a little bit then. So are what you saying are what you're saying is that like if the government said explicitly, we want to provide a benefit to this particular religion, right? Or we're going to impose a burden on this particular religion. Like we're going to say, Episcopalians, you get a special benefit. Or Episcopalians, we're going to like make you pay extra taxes. That would be a problem. But if the government set up a tax law that like only applied to one group without actually naming them, then maybe that wouldn't be a problem. So if it's providing a benefit to the um, to the religious group, I don't know that I want to go so far as say it's not a problem, but there's no judicial recourse to it. If they're specifically burdening the, Epis burdening the Episcopalians, then Episcopalians would have standing to challenge that. So they, they can't really pass a tax law that says, hey, Mormons, we're going to tax you guys and no one else because Mormons would then have standing to challenge that under um, the First Amendment and likely would win. Um, but if they say, hey, Mormons, we're going to provide you a special benefit, and right now I'm blinking on any particular benefit that they would provide to Mormons, but 
Well, maybe 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 like a genealogy benefit. Maybe a genealogy benefit, something like that. You can deduct the expenses of doing genealogy. And they have done that. So I used Amish on purpose. In the 1950s, the government said to um, the Amish – they didn't explicitly say Amish, but they said religions that don't believe in insurance that were – established before I think 1954, don't have to pay the self-employment tax under these certain circumstances. And basically they meant the Amish. Um, right, a category of one. <laughs> a category of not a whole lot more than one. And it was after some lobbying because Amish belief, as I understand it from the reading and research I've done, is that um, social insurance and insurance in general violates – their religious duties because it's their religious duties as a people to care for each other. So social security, other benefits like that go against that. And so they got an exemption from the social security taxes. They also don't get social security benefits um, if they're self-employed. Um, they gave that up in exchange. But this is a benefit specifically aimed at self-employed Amish farmers, I assume, or self-employed Amish furniture makers or others. Mm -hmm. So as I understand it then, the benefit is fine, but if the government had decided not to provide the benefit, then those same Amish people wouldn't be able to go to the IRS and say, hey, this is wrong. Our religious beliefs say that we shouldn't do this. Exactly. They can make the political case. Um, they can go to their senators, to their representatives and say, hey, this violates our religion. And in fact, that's what they did. Please write this exemption for us. Please write this special law for us. That's cool. They can do that. But if the government said, if Congress said, hey, we're not going to provide this benefit, they don't have any judicial standing to say, hey, we need this benefit anyway. Because again, um, collecting revenue is such an integral part of government that it trumps religious free exercise, religious beliefs. Okay. So in the introduction to your book, as well as in, in the body, you talk about some pretty interesting examples of people who have sort of putative religious objections to paying any taxes at all. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, sort of like what was going on, what happened, and why was that the right or wrong outcome? So there were... I mean, there have been a lot of individuals. My understanding is this got really big in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, you know, today, well, it's probably less relevant today, but there was essentially a mail order ministry that you could pay a certain fee and become a minister. And in recent years, it was used by people who wanted to perform same-sex marriages or want to perform marriages. Um, in the 70s, people would get these mail order ministries and they'd be ordained a minister, and then they would declare that – one of a couple things. Quite frequently, they would say, hey, my house is now my ministry. I'm taking a vow of poverty, so I will direct that any income that I make go to my house, to my ministry. My ministry will control it, and therefore, I don't have to pay any taxes. Um, frankly – most of these people, my, as best I can tell, were not sincere. Um, these aren't like Jesuits. These aren't like Catholic priests and nuns who take legitimate vows of poverty because their ministry, their house, they were the ones who controlled it, and they used their control over the ministry's money to buy their house, to buy their groceries, to do all their stuff. And that's basically where the court – came out. It said, you don't have a right not to pay taxes as a minister. Somehow you're being a minister doesn't make you exempt from tax. Moreover, this is basically a fraudulent transaction. You've never given up control over the money. So because you have control, you have to pay taxes on the money, even though you claim to have taken a vow of poverty, even though you claim that the money never actually goes to you. So how does this work for people who actually do work for like a legitimate church who aren't actually controlling the money and who are in fact taking a bona fide vow of poverty. Right. So um, it's come up in a couple cases that I go over in the book. The two that I go over, one is a Jesuit priest 
and the other is a nun. Um, and in both cases, they took outside work. The basic rule that the IRS has established is if you've taken a legit vow of poverty and you work for your order, then you don't have to include any income. So if I were a Jesuit priest and I work as a bookkeeper for the Jesuits, um, the, I don't exactly know how it works. I don't know if they pay me or if they just allocate money to themselves. But if it's all internal, you don't have income. You don't pay taxes on that income. In this case, you had a Jesuit priest who was assigned by his superiors to teach a history of Catholicism class or a Catholic theology class at the University of Virginia. And so he did, and he wanted them to pay his paychecks directly to his order for whatever reason the university couldn't, but he signed the paychecks over to his order when he got them. And along with doing that, um, the, and then the IRS says, you're, you have income in the amount of the amount that you've earned. Um, even though it went to your order, the tax law has what's called the fruit of the tree doctrine, where if the money is earned because of your efforts, um, you have you have to include it in tax, even if you assign it over to someone else. Um, I mean, that would keep me from example, having Loyola pay my salary to my kids who are in a much lower tax bracket than I am, at least if they split all of my income. Even though the money goes directly to my kids, because I'm the one who earned it, I'm the one who pays taxes on it. So how does that how, so how does that work in practice then? So in the case of this priest who's paying the money directly over to the order, would it then be counted as income to the priest, which would then also be a charitable contribution, which he could then deduct? And like, what would be the net outcome? So that is the hard thing. The court says. We we acknowledge that this is a legitimate, sincere vow of poverty, you, you know, and we accept and acknowledge that you don't have control over the money, that you've given it to your order, that they have control over it. They can decide what to do. You technically, in this case, you got the paycheck, but you never controlled the paycheck. Nonetheless, fruit of the tree doctrine, it's income to you. They don't go much further than that. In practice, it would mean that he would get a charitable deduction for donating it to his order because even though it went directly to his order, in theory, it goes to him and then he gives it to his order. Except that that creates a problem because the tax law, when you donate to a private charity, you can only deduct – it used to be 50 percent. Right now, it's 60 percent of essentially your adjusted gross income. So because I like to do math with nice round numbers, that means if UVA paid him $100,000, I know that there's almost no way it paid him $100,000, but I can do that math. They pay him $100,000. He donates that $100,000 to um, his order. He only gets a deduction today of $60,000. So he has income of $40,000 that he has to pay taxes on. And and so I don't know as a practical matter because the case doesn't go into it. So I don't know as a practical matter how he met that requirement. I would assume that the order allocated some of the money to him and he used that to pay his taxes, which creates other potential problems. But I assume that's what happens as a practical matter. But where you have a legit vow of poverty where you don't control the money and you turn it all over, that becomes really, really complicated. And then with the nun, just not to leave the nun out, she got a degree in social work. And part of the degree in social work at the time was she had to work for, I think, a state agency. The state agency paid her. She turned the money over to her order. Same result. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So you also talk in the book about some religious people who had objections not to paying taxes and who weren't necessarily sort of taking a vow of poverty, but objected to paying taxes insofar as the money was going to be used for certain purposes. Sort of what was the thinking there and and how did the government sort of how did the courts deal with those kinds of objections? So there there were a couple different objections. The one that I find most compelling is the Quakers. Um, the Society of Friends has something called the peace testimony, where they're opposed to war, they're opposed to violence. And so there were a number of Quakers who took 
who who looked at the federal budget and I don't remember off the top of my head, but like forty or sixty percent of the federal budget at the time went to the Pentagon and to the military and stuff like that. And they said, okay, we owe twenty thousand dollars in taxes. Forty percent is going to something that we object to. We object to supporting it. Like they are pacifists. There's conscientious objectors. They don't actually go to war. And so they said, we also, for religious reasons, we can't fund the war. So what the Quakers often do is they say, okay, we owe $20,000 in tax. That's a big tax bill, actually. But again, round numbers. We owe $20,000 in taxes. 40% is going to stuff that we don't want. That means we're not going to pay $8,000. We'll pay $12,000 of our tax bill. Um, and we'll put the other $8,000 in an escrow account. And government will will announce this on our tax return, and we will turn that escrow account over to you once you promise us that you'll allocate it to something other than the Pentagon and other than the military. So um, other groups that do this, there were some Catholics who objected because they oppose abortion and they didn't want the funding going to abortion. I'm not exactly sure how that went because generally speaking under law, government funds, federal funds don't go to fund abortion. But assuming that they're sincere, the courts assumed that they were sincere, they didn't actually escrow the money. They just paid a smaller percentage of their tax bill. And it, it goes to the court. And the Quakers know that this is going to be the result because they've been lobbying for a change. And the courts say, yeah, we understand that you object to war, you object to funding war, you object to supporting war, but nonetheless, the government has this compelling interest in collecting revenue. So even though you object to war, and even though you could be a conscientious objector and not fight, you have to pay your taxes, even if that money is going to go to support something that you oppose. They say the same thing to the Catholics who oppose abortion. You don't have a religious right to not pay taxes that will go to support something that you are religiously opposed to. Um, it, and that's the mm -hmm. result that happens unless and until the Quakers get their bill through. And again, I like the Quakers the best because they're not saying we want to pay less of our taxes. They're saying we just want you to guarantee us that that money won't go to the Pentagon. And from an economic perspective, that's probably not terribly hard since money's fungible. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking, I mean, can't the, can't the government just kind of stipulate we're going to use somebody else's money to pay for the Pentagon? I mean... I, yeah, I, I think the government could do that. But on the other hand, I, if I were the government, I wouldn't want to set the precedent that taxpayers get to directly say what, can, what you can use their tax dollars for. Mm. You know, because all of a sudden, you know, some people might say, I want you to promise that my money's not going to go toward the National Endowment for the Humanities, and other people say, I, I don't want it to go to the Education Department or, you know, whatever. <laughs> and again, if they're not saying it for religious reasons, you lose the religious incentive, but the religious reasons aren't constitutionally mandated for these purposes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it, the bill that they're pushing has been in Congress for a bunch of the last 10 or 15 years. It's not passed yet. I am not a um, legislative pro prognosticator, so I don't really have any idea if it will pass. Um, but but for right now, in spite of the fact that money is fungible, um, that you don't have the right to not pay to support things that you oppose. So you, you talked a little bit about the parsonage exemption earlier in our conversation. I wonder if you could explain a little bit about kind of what that is, where it came from, how it works, and sort of, I understand so a lot of people kind of object to it or think it's a bad idea, and I wonder why that is. Okay, so the parsonage allowance, there's a general rule in the tax law that basically everything is income, you have to pay taxes on everything. Is at least every unless there's an exception to it. So everything that your employer gives you is income. So like Loyola, when they pay me, they give me a check or actually they deposit money in my bank account, but they give me cash. But if they give me non-cash things, for the most part, that's income to me too. So for example, if part of my salary, Loyola pays me $100,000 and then gives me a plate lets me live in a place and that's worth 20 the rent would be $20,000 a year i have $120,000 of income 
I have the cash plus the fair market value of what I receive. In the late 19 teens, the Treasury Department came up with an exception to that. And the exception was essentially, if you get housing for the convenience of your employer, you don't have to include that in gross income. And their first example was for seamen. So if you're on a ship, if you're a sailor on a ship, technically you're getting housing. That is, you get living quarters <laughs> in the ship. I know. We were just in New England and you know, old whaling ships, those quarters were probably not worth a ton. But nonetheless, you get housing. And theoretically, the value of that housing should be income to you. Um, so what the Treasury Department said was, if it's for the convenience of the employer, if it's given for non-compensatory reasons, it's not going to be income. It, it, you don't have to include it in your gross income. First thing they said was semen, and then they came up with a couple other examples. Today, probably the best example is if you work on an oil rig, and like there's no, you, you have to stay on the oil rig for weeks, and there's no housing anywhere near it. That's non-compensatory reasons, and under Section 119 of the code, you're not going to have to include that in gross income. Similarly, there's an example of a guy who ran um, a funeral home, and he argued, I have to live here because hearses come in night and day, and I have to be here to answer the telephone back before there were cell phones. So I'm here for the convenience of the employer for non-compensatory reasons. But in about 19... 20, 1921, um, the Treasury Department explicitly said, however, clergy never get this example. It, clergy never get this for the convenience of the employer example. So if your clergy in your church has a parsonage and lets you live in that parsonage, that will always be income to you. Now, Congress didn't love that. So almost immediately after it, Congress passed a law explicitly saying, um, where uh, the term they use is minister of the gospel, which is problematic, and eventually the IRS had to interpret that much broader than just Christian clergy. But where a minister of the gospel receives in-kind housing, he or she, at the time probably he, doesn't have to include that in gross income. So that's a fine rule. We go on. In 1954, some Baptists and others start objecting. They say this parsonage allowance favors rich churches that have property and that own parsonages. But it discriminates against us churches where we don't have a parsonage. We can't afford it. Um, and so Congress in 1954 passes a second part to the parsonage allowance. And that is a minister of the gospel doesn't have to include a housing allowance that's designated as a housing allowance in his or her gross income. And all of a sudden, this becomes a lot better because as clergy, um, you ca you get a hundred thousand dollars salary. Again, clergy never gets a hundred thousand dollars salary, but you get a hundred thousand dollars salary, salary, and your church designates twenty thousand of it as a housing allowance. You only have to pay taxes on eighty thousand dollars, not a hundred thousand dollars. Even though, if you were getting a hundred thousand dollars and no housing, you'd spend twenty thousand dollars on housing, and you'd have eighty thousand dollars after housing, but you would have paid taxes on the full $100,000. So this is a real benefit to clergy. And frankly, it's a benefit to churches and religions too, because technically they can split the tax savings. So maybe you pay $98,000 and designate $20,000 as housing allowance. And after taxes, both the employer and the minister are better off. So there are objections to both parts of this parsonage allowance. Because the housing part, the in-kind housing, is better than the general 119 exempt, exemption because the, the provision of housing doesn't have to be for the convenience of the employer. It can be explicitly compensatory, and that's fine. That's not a problem. Um, so you fast forward, you fast forward, you fast forward, and in a, I want to say 2012 or 2013, the Freedom From Religion Foundation sues challenging this provision. And they sue and say, this is an establishment of religion. This favors religion over non-religion um, because we are – the named um, plaintiffs were executives with the Freedom from Religion Foundation, which is a nonprofit. They says this treats 
religion better than non-religion. We can't get tax-free housing. We can't get a tax-free housing allowance. They go through, they win at the district court level. They get to the Seventh Circuit and the Seventh Circuit said, sorry, you don't have standing to challenge this. Um, actually, I think the district court said, you don't have standing to challenge the in-kind housing provision. But definitely the Seventh Circuit says, you don't have standing to challenge it. You never got rejected from this. You never tried to take it. Who knows? Maybe the IRS would have treated you as non-religious clergy. So they go back and step two, they had the Freedom From Religion Foundation designate five or $10,000 of their salary as a housing allowance. And originally the IRS accepts it and they write a letter saying, are you sure? And the <laughs> IRS rejects it. So they sue again. Yeah, I mean, I, I think probably the IRS just missed it. Um, but so they... They sue again, and again, the district court says, okay, now you have standing. And the reason they did this was in the Seventh Circuit decision, they said in a footnote, you might have standing if you were to claim the housing allowance, it was rejected, and then you sue. So they did exactly what the Seventh Circuit told them to do. They went and they sued, and this they win in the district court level again, and that win happened like as my book was going to press. So that's about as far as my book goes. Um, they win again. The government appeals. They go to the Seventh Circuit, and this all happens after my book. But the Seventh Circuit looks at it, and they say – and I think they're wrong in this, but they say this is a constitutional provision because it meets the lemon test. It, it prevents unnecessary entanglement, and there's historical significance to exempting clergy housing. Um, I might be writing more about that because they conflate property tax exemptions with income tax exemptions. There are all sorts of problems with that. Mm. But right now, the court has said this exemption is um, constitutional. So why do people have problems with it? I, I mean, my big problem with it, the reason I think most people have problems with it is it really does treat a religious practice better than a non-religious practice. If my employer gives me cash and designates it as a housing allowance, I pay taxes on it. And there's no way that I don't pay taxes on it. Um, if they, so that's clearly better than um, if I were clergy, I would be able to exempt that amount from taxes. And the only difference is as clergy, I'm getting it for religious purposes. As non-clergy, I'm getting it for non-religious purposes. It, and then for me, and the Seventh Circuit addresses this and blows it off, but part of the problem is if you look at the legislative history in 1954 when they passed this, um, basically it was um, Red Scare stuff. They said the the guy who's promoting it, the senator who's promoting it says, and we need th – there's this difference between the treatment of rich religions and poor religions. Also, we need to thank our ministers who are doing a great job of preventing us from becoming communist and holding communism at bay. And so that makes it look like at least one purpose was to thank clergy, thank ministers, thank religious people. Hmm. Hmm. Well, so one of the ways that people often interact with and 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 by people I mean like like non clergy religious believers interact with this kind of intersection between the church and tax law is in relation to exemptions, tax exemptions or tax deductions for contributions to churches, which are of course charitable organizations under under the under the tax code. Right. Um, and there, you know, you, 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 you talk about a few kind of interesting and kind of difficult questions about sort of when a contribution to a church counts as a deductible expense and when it doesn't, in, in particular in relation to Scientology. So I, I wonder if you could talk about that one because it's just an example that I really like. Absolutely. So in Scientology, um, there is a practice called auditing, and I don't know everything about Scientology, but one of the things that you're trying to do is eliminate – I think they're called thetans – eliminate bad spirits, bad experiences from your life so that you can progress and move up. And you do that partly through this practice called auditing. The auditing is a Scientologist goes in with a higher Scientologist. I, I assume it's a type of clergy position. I don't know exactly. 
and you use a device called an e-meter to audit yourself, to free yourself from these bad things that are holding you back. And in Scientology, there's basically a payment scale for it. Um, so a certain number of hours costs a certain amount. And as you get higher up, it costs different amounts. So as you progress, you pay money in exchange for this. And so Scientologists were deducting these auditing payments as charitable contributions to the church, and the IRS said no. And so the Scientologists went to court, ended up at the Supreme Court in a decision called Hernandez, which is absolutely fascinating and should absolutely be required reading for everybody because it's really a cool decision. And it's a cool story about like the Scientologists' practices. But anyway, so they go through and they say, we're not – because I guess I should back up. When you make a charitable contribution, it's deductible unless you get something of value in return. So for me, the quintessential example is when you donate to your local NPR station. The NPR, you hear the pledge thrive. You've heard it too many times, and so you finally give in and you give them money. Um, and they say the cool thing about giving us money is you can get something in return, quintessentially an NPR tote bag. So if I donate one hundred twenty thousand or one hundred twenty one hundred twenty dollars to NPR, if I donated one hundred twenty thousand dollars, they'd really like. Me. <laughs> if I donate a hundred, if I donate one hundred twenty dollars to them, ten dollars a month, they love the monthly contributions. Then I can get an NPR tote bag. I look on the NPR store, and it turns out that the NPR tote bag sells for twenty eight dollars. What that means is I've donated $120, but I have to subtract $28. I only get to deduct $92 because I got something of value back from them, and that thing of value is worth $28. Similarly, if you donate to NPR and get your year-long subscription to The Atlantic or whatever it is that you get in exchange, you have to offset your charitable contribution by the amount that you get back. Um, so the IRS said, yes, these auditing payments are going to your church, and it is an exempt organization. You can take a deduction for it, but you have to offset it by the value of the thing you get in return. In this case, you're getting auditing services, and it turns out that the auditing services are worth exactly what you paid. So there's no deduction for paying for this auditing. Um, the Scientologists, needless to say, don't like this, and they point out a couple things. They point out, for example, that um, Jewish contributions for tickets for the High Holy Days are deductible, and that what are called pew rents are deductible. And pew rents are an old, like go back at least to colonial days, where Protestant churches, if you pay a certain amount, you get a set pew, you get your name on it, you get to sit there. And it's a way that, especially pre-Civil War, Protestant churches raised money. If you pay for that, you get a that's you don't have to offset your deduction by that amount. Um, there are certain Catholic masses that you can pay the priest to say for deceased relatives. And again, those are fully deductible. The IRS has released revenue rulings for all three of those things saying that they're fully deductible. And Justice O'Connor also points out other things. If you're Mormon and you pay your tithing, you have to pay tithing to go to the temple. But you can fully deduct your tithing even though you get the benefit of going to the temple. And the Supreme Court says, no, your payments for auditing aren't deductible. They're, they're not because you're paying for auditing. And these other questions aren't in front of us. So we're not going to judge – the IRS – we're not going to judge whether it's okay to fully deduct pew rents and tickets for high holy days and all of these other things because that's not the question in front of us. The question in front of us is are you getting a benefit in exchange for your auditing and if so, how much is it worth? You are getting a benefit, and it's worth exactly what you pay, so it's not deductible. Scientologists were not a fan of this. And a couple years later, they entered into a secret but leaked agreement with the IRS, where the IRS said, essentially, you'll be able to deduct 80% of your auditing payments. So going forward, auditing payments are deductible to Scientologists, notwithstanding the Supreme Court's ruling because the IRS made this agreement. Again, it's worth noting that no – even if you object to this, even if you think the Supreme Court's right, no taxpayer has standing to challenge the constitutionality of this agreement. 
so now the IRS has said by administrative decree that auditing payments are deductible. And the next question is, is that right? And I think honestly that the IRS is right in that. And I think it for actually non-religious reasons. I think partly because they're right that a bunch of other religions get to make deductible payments even though they get something in return. And, and so this is really tricky. Um, it, and where I would come down on it is spiritual and religious benefits. It's really hard to put a precise monetary value on them. And along with that, in practice, like a lot of museums, if you get a year-long membership to the museum, um, they'll tell you that the full amount that you gave them is deductible, even though you clearly get something of value. Like when I was a member of the Shedd Aquarium, I think a family membership was like $120 or $140. For my family to, of five to go would be like $50 each time. Mm. So I'm getting some sort of financial benefit, but they say the full amount that you donate is deductible. And I'm not really sure how they come to that conclusion. And not all of them do. The Field Museum here in Chicago says none of your membership is deductible, which is probably the better answer. Um, even if it's the less popular answer. Hmm. Um, but on the other hand, I may get the membership just to support the museum. They don't know if I'm going to take my family 10 times during the year or not go at all. So the membership is kind of an intangible, hard to value thing. But I think that a museum membership is easier to value than the cash value of auditing or the value of having your own pew or the value of attending religious holidays or the value of other things. Um, I, I think that it is ultimately a hard question, but I think the question of getting a tote bag where it's sold on their website for a set price is a lot easier to come to a conclusion than the value of some sort of spiritual religious benefit. Mm, mm. Yeah, I mean, it always struck me that like, it's a little weird to talk about these things being sold on the market, right? Because I mean, in, in every case, the good in question that you're getting in exchange for your payment is of value only to people who are believers in that religion. I mean, like, I don't know what Scientologists are willing to pay for, for auditing with an e-meter, but I know how much I'm willing to pay, which is nothing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, I, absolutely. As a non-Scientologist, I am not going to pay for that. I have no interest in it. That doesn't mean that it has no value, but it has no market value. Um, similarly, I mean, maybe my my wife is very interested in Judaism and Jewish practice, and I might have an interest in attending the High Holy Days if that's permitted. As a non-Jew, I don't know if that's permit, permissible or not. But on the other hand, without the religious obligation, without the religious benefit, I may be willing to pay less. As a non-Protestant, I don't really care about their pews. I, I don't need my name on a pew. I don't need a pew reserved for me. As a non-Catholic, I frankly am indifferent to, like, I enjoy going to Mass, but I'm indifferent as to whether a Mass is performed for my deceased relatives. Uh, as a Mormon, I am interested in having the ability to go to the temple, but my non-Mormon neighbors that's absolutely valueless to them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so really quickly, one of the really interesting examples in your book was how the tax law deals with interest, specifically in relation to Sharia law, which prohibits the payment of interest. And so like, how does it treat Islamic believers who are Muslims who structure their finances in such a way that they are, at least according to Islamic law, not paying interest? And are they able to, and should they be able to take interest-related deductions even though they themselves believe that they're not paying interest? Right. So, I mean, for me, on my condo, I pay my mortgage every month, and some portion of my mortgage is interest. For the most part, for individuals, interest is non-deductible, but there are special ex exceptions made for um, certain types of interest, mortgage interest being the big one. So I can deduct the mortgage because I borrowed money from the bank to buy my house and I pay them back with interest. But 
Muslims under Sharia law believe that both receiving and paying interest are impermissible, or at least some Muslims do. I'm not an expert in Islam, but I know that some do. So that creates a problem in the US where there's almost no way to afford in many places housing without borrowing money. So um, so there, there are certain types of Islamic finance that allow you to in effect borrow money without actually borrowing money. The specifics are very specific, but broadly speaking, for example, um, what you do is you go with a bank and the bank buys the house, pays $100,000 for the house. And over the 15 or 30 year period of the Islamic finance instrument, you pay back the $100,000 to the bank. You don't pay any more than the $100,000 because you can't pay interest. But at the same time, you lease or rent the house from the bank and your lease payment is a fixed amount that's roughly equivalent to interest. My understanding is Islamic finance instruments are slightly more expensive still than standard borrowing from banks. So by doing that, you technically haven't paid interest. You've just paid back the principal, but you've the, the bank has gotten its additional money. And when I talk about this, a lot of people say, but hey, that's just disguised interest and that can't be fair. And I'm completely indifferent to that. Under at least some interpretations of Sharia law, that's not interest. So for religious purposes, it's not interest. And technically, for legal purposes, it's not interest. And if it's not interest, what that means is that the borrower technically can't take a deduction because there's no mortgage interest deduction for interest equivalent amounts, which makes buying housing, I mean, considerably more expensive in the early years for a Muslim homeowner than it is for a non-Muslim homeowner. Um, in practice, maybe um, Islamic finance instruments, the banks allocate some of it as interest, although that would strike me as unlikely and kind of defeating the purpose of what they're doing. So Muslim borrowers, if they use fin these Islamic finance instruments, they can't borrow money. They, they, or rather they can't deduct interest on the money they've borrowed. And so they bear the full cost of buying a house. And in the book, and maybe I'll leave it for people to read, but I try to put together this framework for determining whether we should grant, whether the tax law should grant an accommodation. And under the framework, I feel like Muslim borrowers should get an accommodation. The government should say explicitly, or the IRS should say in regulations, that Islamic finance instruments, the interest equivalent amount should be deductible to Muslim borrowers. And I say that because this is a legitimate way that for religious reasons, they're treated worse than other taxpayers. And it's a solution that's fairly easy. It doesn't put the government in a worse position than had they used the standard method. Had they just borrowed money in a standard way, they would be taking that deduction anyway, plus less than I think 1% of Americans are Muslim. So we're not talking a huge amount of lost revenue. And in other places in the tax law and other contexts, we treat interest equivalent amounts as if they were interest. So it's not a hard problem to fix. It's a problem that's very fixable. Um, and it's the kind of problem that I feel like the tax law It's the kind of accommodation that I feel like the tax law should grant. Mm -hmm. So, Sam, in, in closing, maybe you could kind of offer in a nutshell what kind of framework you think courts and maybe the IRS as well ought to use in thinking about offering religious accommodations or kind of when religious accommodations ought to be offered in a tax law context. Right. So I put together kind of three questions that I, I think that policymakers especially should go through, but potentially the IRS and maybe even courts. The first question is, does an individual's religion cause them to act in a tax disadvantaged way? So for instance, the Muslim borrowers, because they can't pay interest, they are forced to act in a tax disadvantaged way. They borrow money, but they can't take the deduction. And that's in contrast to, for example, 
a minister who doesn't have any religious reason why they act in a worse way. If I'm a minister, I have to have housing and the fact that I don't get to exclude that from my gross income doesn't put me in a worse position. So the first question is, am, does my religious practice, do my religious beliefs force me to act or require me to act in a way that is disadvantageous from a tax perspective? The second is, if that's the case, what kind of accommodation would put them in a similar after-tax position as non-religious taxpayers? That is, I don't want them to be in a better position. I wouldn't say that a Muslim um, homeowner should be able to deduct the full amount that they pay back to the bank. Because as a non-Muslim taxpayer, I only get to deduct the interest. I don't get to deduct my full mortgage payment. So if they got to deduct the full amount that they paid, that would put them in a better position. That wouldn't be a good solution. So is there a way that we can do it and what is that way? And then a final question, is there another extrinsic reason that the tax law shouldn't provide the accommodation? Um, and that's just kind of a catch-all. So we meet the first two, but the third one, would this significantly reduce federal revenue? Or would this be really hard for the IRS to administer? Or is there another reason why, even though they're acting in tax disadvantaged way, and theoretically there's a reason that we can do it, maybe there's another reason why we shouldn't grant an accommodation. And I think if we go through those three questions, um, that'll give us, it, it'll reduce the ad hoc nature of this, and it'll let us see what's really a problem and what's not a problem that shouldn't be dealt with. Cool. That sounds very sensible to me. Uh, so thank you so much, Sam. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it was really interesting. Yeah, and a fu super fun book. Thanks. I appreciate it. It was fun to write. I think it has some fun stories. and It's been great talking to you about it. Taxes wasn't cause for much concern, for our uncle wasn't worried over the money that we would earn. But today, with rising taxes on most everything you do, sit back and give a listen and I'll try to tell a few. They have taxed your family auto, not to mention gasoline. Taxed your weekly payroll and a lot that can't be seen. Your telegrams and phone calls, his clothes and carpet tax. You'd think the time would come when revenuers would relax. Taxes, taxes, will you always haunt me? Will I always have to work in vain? You have caused me many tribulations. Taxes, taxes, you have taxed my brain. of prizes on a jackpot giveaway and you think that you are lucky brother think the other way when you finish paying them taxes federal state and city too you wind up paying more in taxes than that jackpot did to you taxes taxes will you always haunt me will i always have to work in vain you have caused me many tribulations taxes taxes you have taxed my brain the scientists are working now they're trying to figure out just how that they can make us all live forever suspended animation for everybody in the nation <laughs> i'm asking you my friend ain't that clever we'll never grow to 65 they'll stop us growing at 64 because at 65 you're going to join the pension ring it's death and taxes that's for sure and for taxes there'll never be a cure so tell me oh death where is thy sting Taxes, taxes, will you always haunt me? Will I always have to work in vain? You have caused me many tribulations. Taxes, taxes, you have taxed my brain. That was Hank Penny.
taxes, taxes.